with us this evening and we really appreciate it. As you heard, that is the recording button being pressed. So I think I've just got a couple of things to tell you housekeeping wise, and then we'll get stuck into the evening. So as I said, there's a lot of us on the call this evening, which is fantastic. So the format we'll follow is that you'll um, be able to see us, the, the speakers and hosts, uh, and you will all be muted, but you'll be able to use the chat and the Q&A functions uh, to ask us questions uh, and engage a bit with us. As you, you know, we've only got an hour and a half, so we'll tr try and get as much information to you as we can, but uh, we've got space for questions as well. So we'll use the Q&A, um, which you should be able to see on the bottom of your screen uh, to pose questions to us and feel free to comment and ask questions as we're going along. We've got sort of two gaps uh, in the evening specifically for questions. And the other thing you can do with the questions, uh, I don't, if you're not familiar with it, you can upvote things. So if you think a question's a really good one, you can vote for it to sort of move to the top of the list uh, and ask us to address it. As I said, we're recording this. So that's the other thing. If you're unable to um, keep up with everything or we've rattled through a lot of information and you want to go back to it, uh, you'll be able to do that afterwards. And obviously, if, if, if you know if somebody's registered and not been able to make it this evening, uh, they'll be able to see that recording and have a good look at that afterwards. Um, the, the other thing to say is we've got a couple of polls, uh, little voting things for you to fill in. Um, I think there's three. Uh, obviously, <clears throat> as if we were on Strictly Come Dancing, um, if you're watching this afterwards, there's no point in trying to fill in the polls. Your vote won't be counted. But if you're watching this now live, uh, we'd love you to fill in those polls as we're going along. Uh, and I think that's all from a housekeeping point of view. Just to say who's on the call and who you're going to be uh, listening to tonight. We've got myself. So I'm Joe Swires and I'm the facilitator for the test and trial for Commons, uh, which is being managed by the Foundation for Common Land and the Federation of Cumbria Commoners. So from those two organisations, we've got Julia, Agley and B. And we have also got Viv Lewis from the Federation of Cumbria Commoners. We've got Susie Hodgson, who's in the background, keeping us organised and, and running everything. And then we're also really pleased to welcome Tracy May and Colin Abel, who've been working with us. Uh, they're from one of the Commons we've been working with in Dartmoor. So we're going to be having a little chat with them as we go along too. Uh, so that's everybody. Uh, I'll crack on now then with um, with the slides, if that's okay, Julia. Julia's going to share the slides for us. <clears throat> so just a quick overview of what we're going to cover this evening. We've got, uh, from me, I'll give you a bit of a, an update on the test and trial progress and what we found out, and also an example from Dartmoor, which is where Tracy and the colony will come in. We'll have a little chat with them. Then we're going to be talking about the things we found out that we hope will be useful for you um, around getting ready for ELM and the kinds of practical steps and things you can be doing now and also how much that might cost, which is always of interest. Then we are going to just quickly mention other bits of work that are coming up that I um, mean, once this test and trial is finished, because we're sort of wrapping this up now, uh, by March it will be finished. Um, so that's the next one. And then we've also got. Um, an update from Julia towards the end of the evening, thinking about how all this stuff that we've talked about tonight uh, fits with what we know about policy as it's developing uh, and what's going to be in the new scheme. So um, hopefully that will give it some relevance and you'll be able to go away thinking, oh, from what I've heard, these are some of the things I might want to get involved in and what, want to do to get ready. OK, I think that's everything. Was there another one? Yeah, right. So I'll just... Um, some reason I've got my, that's better. I could see myself and it was putting me off. <laughs> All right, so it's me up first uh, to tell you a bit more about the progress on our test and trial and what we've been finding out. So I'm gonna just have a really quick recap. If you've not joined us before, um, this might be just useful. To, so we've, we've been working, you can just flick through those actually, um, Julia, and I'll just talk a little bit about that um, model. So our test and trial kicked off in, um, July 2020, um, in the thick of COVID really. Um, so the approach that we've taken has probably been um, not quite as participatory in terms of meeting people face to face as we would have liked. Um, but the whole aim of the test and trial was to develop and try out and test a model for delivering ELM on commons. So this is the sort of 
overview, a little illustration that we've uh, shared throughout the test and trial. And so basically, uh, this model that we've been developing uh, starts with a sort of baseline, um, which we've, we've, we've tried to put together on a map of what public goods are on the common. And then we've looked ahead and said, what do we want the common to look like in 10 years time? And then we've been trying in the middle, that sort of purple box, um, what would go into a management plan to help us set that out? So what, how we get from A to B. And then underpinning all that, we've got a whole ream of information, guidance and tools um, to help get those jobs done and help uh, a common get ready for Elm. So we'll tell you a bit more about that in a minute. So if you go on to the next one, please, Julia. Okay, so the blue here, I just wanted to show you sort of what we've been doing since we started. So once we, we drafted, um, had a go at drafting a, a sort of model with various bits of advice and guidance in it back uh, in October 2020. And we recruited uh, four different commons to work with us to start developing that and trying that out. So that was one on the North York Moors, one in Cumbria, one on Dartmoor and one in the Cotswolds. And so those four commons, all um, we employed a local facilitator. So Tracy who's on the call tonight was our local facilitator in Dartmoor. And they worked with us with a common that um, we selected uh, and well, we asked for people who were interested and then we selected four commons uh, to work with. And they started with the sort of blue stuff, if you like, uh, and had a go with that. And now, 18 months further down the line, we've, we've developed those tools and guidance quite a bit uh, through working with our commons. We had two more commons this autumn that we've tried out on as well. Uh, so the green is now where we've got to. And if you look right at the bottom, the sort of bottom right hand corner, all of those tools and bits of guidance and advice are now online. We've, we've got a, a portal uh, set up. So at the beginning, we were just sending out, you know, one or two documents. But now we've got a lot of that information and guidance on the, this toolkit. If you go to the next one, please, Julia. OK, so we, we last did our, um, we, asked, we had an update last September. So I thought I'd tell you a little bit about uh, what we've done since then and what we've been learning. So uh, thankfully, uh, something which we would be sort of been hoping to do throughout the whole test and trial we were able to meet quite a lot more people uh, in the autumn once the sort of COVID restrictions have been um, lifted a bit. So if you could go on to the next one, Julia. So in October, we were able to um, test out a lot of what we'd uh, developed on the new forest, which was, which was one of our sort of phase two commons, which came a bit later. So we had a whole week of engaging with commoners in the new forest, and you can see the weather was good too, which helped. Uh, and our focus, because the New Forest is so huge and has got so many different stakeholders involved in managing the common there, we focused in on talking to commoners and graziers um, because we, with the time and the resources that we've got, we knew we couldn't sort of cover everybody. So we had four workshops, uh, which we held in different locations around the common. Um, and we looked at some of the work we've been doing on how to identify and assess public goods um, and some of the test and trial, some of the tools that we've been developing through the test and trial. So for example, we've got a checklist um, with all the different headings of what, what public goods are and how you might find them on your common and what they look like and, and, and you know, to try and come up with an overview of the public goods. Um, we've got maps and I um, advice on doing mapping and then also thinking about what we're going to a management plan and talking about what we want the common to look like in the future. So we had a, a really good week testing some of that out on the new forest and we also had a group of young commoners that that we did a session with as well and I suppose one of the things that I'd say um, about that week that was great was we were sort of finally able to get groups of people together and get out on the common and look at stuff on the ground and we, we've we've tried lots of different methods of engaging with people and obviously we've you know a lot of that has been um, driven by Covid but we felt that that was uh, one of the sort of best ways of really getting to the root of things and getting a really good feedback from people, you know, looking at things outside on the common uh, in groups of people who share similar interests. So that was great. And then if we could just move on to the next one, Juliet. This one was around Exmoor. So Viv uh, went to Exmoor around the same time. It took a slightly different approach uh, in that we had a shorter amount of time on Exmoor. 
So I did a, a, a quite a big workshop with a mix of people, both from sort of agencies uh, and other organisations, as well as I think there were 10 farmers grazers who, who joined that one. And they again tested out some of the tools that we've been developing. And because it was... Um, because the time was a bit shorter and they weren't able to get outside for as long, we used uh, maps, which again have been a, a sort of real feature of our test and trial and have really helped people um, to have good discussions and conversations around what they think is important on their common. So um, it was great that we were able to draw on some of the work that Exmoor National Park had been doing previously and use the maps to discuss public goods there. So that was uh, on Exmoor and then just one more I think Julia please next one okay so then the third thing that we've sort of really done a lot of work on since we last saw you at the end of September is this online toolkit so a lot of the like I said a lot of the advice and guidance we've been preparing is now uh, online uh, and we're hoping to sort of make this public it's still very much a work in progress uh, in the next couple of weeks but what, it, what that does is all the bits of guidance, um, templates, downloadable checklists and all the rest of it are now online. So anybody will be able to go on there and have a look through that and find things that hopefully will be useful for them to help them get their common ready for Elm. Uh, and Julia and Viv are going to show us a bit more of that shortly. So like the one at the bottom, it's kind of a step by step uh, process to work through to help you think about what you need to do to get your common ready for a new scheme and then one of the other sections is all around understanding public goods and there's a whole uh, set of advice and guidance do it yourself type stuff for you to look at in there if you could go to the next one please Julia okay so I'll be quiet for a minute uh, Julie's just going to show us a little bit about uh, one of the sections in the toolkit, which is around governance, if you don't mind, Julia. Thank you very much, Joe. And, and so lovely to have so many people with us. And we do encourage you to chat with each other in the chat. Um, so we won't take offence. It's really nice to see sort of people multitasking and parallel conversations going on. Uh, so, um, yes, the it's lovely. The toolkit is actually live on our website now. Um, so it's under the resources section on the Foundation for Common Lands website, as, as Joe said, work in progress. But one of the things that's very distinctive about commons is this, that you have multiple parties with multiple legal interests um, involved. And, and, and that's a really key thing that DEFRA are looking at on non-commons as well. So they're very interested in collaboration and commons are the original collaborate form of collaborative land management. 50% of common land, 50% of England was common land, it's only now 3%. And DEFRA are really keen to get people elsewhere collaborating. So this is a real opportunity looking at commons and how can we make that governance work? Because governance is absolutely critical. We've got a lot of different types of legal interests on commons. So the association, usually a commons association isn't actually incorporated, but um, it's a voluntary, uh, it's, it's an unincorporated organization. And there will be commoners as members and the owners. And commoners and owners can come in different shapes and sizes with different interests and different practical management um, perspectives as well. So with commoners, we have graziers, we have people who were graziers, perhaps stopped, but still sort of consider themselves as having been graziers. We have non-graziers who may just have some rights attached to their house. And then we have new graziers, people who would like to come in and become um, and start grazing. They have legal rights. Then we have owners and there are different types of interest. We have those who are interested in the land. They may be interested from perspective of being a water company. They may be a grouse small. They may be a traditional agricultural estate. Um, they may be a public body um, and uh, it may be a, a council as well uh, and a local council. And there are also the sporting interests as well to take into account. So it's really important that you engage with all these people. And this is why governance is so important because this just doesn't just happen. Bringing everybody together and delivering collectively and collaboratively really needs a lot of work. So one of the things we're first asked 
suggesting that you might want to look at is how healthy is your organization, a sort of health check. And we've got a page on our website uh, on the toolkit. So there's, if you look at there, there is sort of, it's a bit like those of you who remember play school who are as old as I am, you know, you go through these different windows and this is the one on Commons governance. And we've got these different, um, you can click on these and click through to have different information. I just thought this evening I would show you through one of these um, sections. But one of the things in terms of sort of doing this fitness check is that, well, I'm gonna show you through two bits. One about an initial checklist and then using that to decide which bits of the toolkit you might like to go to. So is, you know, is our common association fit for purpose is the question to ask, particularly when the amount of money coming in under local nature recovery, potentially under landscape recovery is really um, critical. Uh, it's really large amounts of money. So it's, it's important. There's a huge duty of care placed upon um, officers. So the first thing is, is, do you have an, a constitution? When was it written? Does it need to be reviewed? Secondly, do you have active officers? Um, do you have, or maybe you have an administrator, if there are only a small number of people, if there are less than five beneficiaries, uh, DEFRA, RPA, often allow there to be an administrator. Um, are they independent? What is, uh, how is it that working? Well, then absolute key is financial management. So this covers a huge range of areas. We've got quite a lot on the website. How um, on the toolkit, for instance, money um, and both bookkeeping, distribution of funds, um, auditing. Then live register, I'm gonna come back to this, and then rules and penalties and dispute resolution. So it's absolutely essential that you have rules, rules for grazing, rules for management, ensuring not only does your, your common will have multiple functions. It will, you may well have an ELM scheme or you currently have a stewardship scheme, but there will be other areas. You will need to be managing it for, um, for cattle grazing, for good practice, for agricultural practice, and for other areas of maybe, you know, if it's active um, use, maybe it's a golf course, maybe there are areas, you know, it's a grouse small, what other, other activities are going on. And then dispute resolution, because what's wonderful is when all this paperwork just sits in the bottom drawer, but um, I can assure you there are enough times that disputes do arise or changes occur as well, and you need to be able to bring that paperwork out I have a process for solving those um, disputes. So this is an area where, where there's quite a lot of sort of nerdy information on this, and we don't sort of apologize for this because actually there's quite a lot, lot of process to go through. For instance, here we're creating, um, a, it gives you the information to create a live register. And for all the information we have on our website, we also enable it to be downloaded as a PDF so that you can then um, have it available. You don't always have to be connected to our website. Um, but this is an area where we're, we're taking you through the process of creating a register and explaining what a commons register is. And then as you see down the bottom, transcribe the commons register into a spreadsheet or table. And then we have a little button and you click the right live register template and that will download a spreadsheet. And so we've tried to, and we're really interested in your views. So if you go through this and you find it just doesn't work, you know, it's a bit like the IKEA information really, you know, that it doesn't work. You're missing the critical alum key or the bit of information what to do. Do tell us because we'd like to improve these all the time. It's very easy for us to change them. So this is the steps how to do it. And then there um, on, the, on the spreadsheet, there are little tabs along the bottom and here are some extracts from them. So one of them is about typing out the current commons register. The next one is creating the live register. So this will cross reference the commons, right, but who are the people currently using the rights? And are they actively using them? Are they an owner? Are they a tenant? Is there just an informal arrangement? Often bottles of whiskey change hands once a year and that's the, the arrangement. So then the contact details, it's really important you can get in touch with people. And then finally, a sort of summary of your common. So I won't go through the details of that, but just to show you that the, we're providing information at all sorts of levels to help you through the process. Brilliant. So Thank you, Delia, for whizzing business. through that. <laughs> yeah. So um, that's hopefully given you just a little insight into one bit of the toolkit uh, and the kind of things you might find on there. Uh, the other thing that we've been doing quite a bit of work on through the test and trial, um, and which is sort of feeding into our findings, is around how much some of this stuff might cost you. Um, so I'm going to uh, pass to Viv now and she'll just share a bit of work we've been doing about working some of those numbers out. Thanks Viv. 
Okay, well, good evening, everybody. And it's great to be back with you. And it's great to see so many people attend. Um, in this last summer, the Minister Victoria Prentice came to visit us or visit our test and trial in Nether Wasdale in the Lake District. It was a glorious day and the fells looked absolutely amazing, which was really great. But one of the th things that the minister asked us to do is if we could calculate the costs of joining a scheme. Well, being the sort of willing people that we are, we said we'd have a look at it um, and have a go at looking at the costs. So we've had, well, I was going to say we've had a first stab. It's more than that. And I'm going to present this to you. And at the end of my presentation, we're going to have a quick poll because I'd like to hear from you whether you think our costs are realistic. Can you move the slide on? Okay, well, Joe's already showed this slide. This is, this is a slide from our toolkit. And these are the steps that, uh, that we think are important for getting ready for ELM. And what I've done is translate these steps into actual tasks. And then we've tried to, to cost out the tasks. So in the next slide, I'm gonna show this to you in more detail. Can you move it on, please? Okay, so we've done a breakdown of the steps into these key tasks and given some sort of estimated day rates. So, and who will actually do the tasks? So we think, and one of our findings is that we need independent facilitation. I mean, maybe in very small commons and very well organized commons, they don't need it. But um, so the facilitator could be a land agent, it could be someone who already is working in a facilitation fund for the um, facilitation fund. It could be a, a, someone who's really good at working with groups of people who knows about conflict resolution. There's a huge amount of tasks that the facilitator is going to have to do. And one of the first things would be drawing together those involved. I mean, it's really important that all the stakeholders, all those who have legal rights on commons are actually involved in this. Sometimes those people are absent, we don't know who they are, and it takes a bit of time to find them. Another role will be around sourcing data, identify gaps of data. Um, it's really important to facilitate meetings. There's going to be lots of meetings to get this to work, especially if you're going into local nature recovery or landscape recovery. There'll be meetings with one-to-one, -one. there'll be meetings with maybe with groups of active graziers, non-graziers, landowners, you might have you know, meetings with different types of groups and also bigger meetings. Then one of the, another task a facilitator you know, is likely to do is project manage the mapping of public goods, especially if you're going to get external people to come in. Um, consensus building. This, is a, this can be really quite a tricky issue um, because um, especially on, in, well, we'll have to wait and see, but I mean, I think my understanding is that potentially in SFI and local nature recovery and landscape recovery, there might be um, land, um, land management plans. Uh, these land management plans, depending on the length of scheme, it's about you know, deciding on what the aims are, what, you, what you're going to get to you know, in your 10 years. And it's about building consensus around that, agreeing on the aims and building a consensus around how do you get there. And also to build and write the land management plan. You know, this is a fairly, this is a fairly, well, it is a skilled task. And we're putting a rate at the moment of 350 a day. You may agree, you may disagree, but that's, these, these are sort of ballpark figures we're working with at the moment. A lot of commons already have administrators and there's definitely a role for them in, in getting ready for ELM. And a lot of it's around supporting the facilitator, maintaining and updating the registers and databases. I mean, Julia talked about live register. A lot of commons associations don't have lives registers and that's something that the administrator could do. Budgets and day-to-day -day expenditure. I mean, you know, this will all cost money. Someone's got to keep a track of the money and the bookkeeping. They may be writing the agendas and minutes and taking minutes for the meetings, supporting the chairs and officers of association and communication and correspondence with the members. And we're suggesting this will be around 200 pounds a day, this sort of work. And then there's a mapping and advice and support needed. Um, you know, maps need to be uh, created if we're doing, if we're preparing the maps, if we're using things like land app or QGIS that will need technical um, expertise to come in and help on that and also to digitize the public goods and information training the commoners how to match fe map features and support to, in to interpret the information there are will be other tasks as well but these are the sort of core tasks we're thinking will, will be in this section and we're su suggesting 350 pound a day um, there's a public goods survey, survey because of it, around payment for public goods. It's all around how, you know, getting a baseline in and then what we're going to do to maintain or improve the condition. So there's habitat condition assessments, peat surveys, peat depth, possibly soil carbon assessments. 
and undertake the survey work and reports. Now, in our previous um, test and trials um, webinar, we had David Morley, or David Morley pro uh, provided us with a presentation and from h and Land. He suggested it could be around £2.50 to £3.50 a hectare. So we've put that price in. And then legal advice, drawing up the deed, internal agreements, constitutions, we put £200 an hour. That may be quite cheap for some solicitors, I don't know. So those are the majority of tasks. There will be others and some cost put to it. Uh, next slide, please. As we know, all commons are different. So we thought that we'd try and cost out different types of commons and different types of scenarios. So these are some scenarios that we've come up with. We've got a sort of medium to large size common in a protected landscape, and it's got some triple SI on the common. They're already in an HS, HLS rollover. They do have FET maps available, but the sort of habitat information is now 10 years old. The Commoners Association itself is not functioning particularly well. Um, they do have a sort of annual general meeting, but I mean, it's sort of people have run out of steam to some extent. Their records are out of date. They've got 10 active graziers, 10 non graziers, and two owners. And I will, in the next slide, I'll say, tell you how much it, you know, we think it might cost to do this. We've got another type of common, which is a hundred, a thousand hectare sporting common. They're not in an HLS. They have limited data and maps. The Commons Association is disbanded and there is no governance in place. There is a large area of potential peat, uh, peat for restoration. And this is why it might be interested in, they would be interested in going to, uh, into Elm. They have five active graziers, but at the moment they don't get on. And also they have two owners. So you can see there might be a bit of contention in this common. So it might take a bit you know, longer to facilitate the facilitator to get it together. And we've got scenario three, which is a smaller common and it's majority of it's triple SI. Oops. <laughs> Thank you, Julia. <laughs> um, basically, this, is, this common is owned by a conservation charity. And so already the, the, the commoners, the active commoners there are doing conservation grazing. They have detailed maps and habitat data available. The grazing rights are not being all utilized. The common association has run well. Um, but the registers need updating. They've got three active graziers, 10 non-graziers, and the owner is a conservation charity, as I mentioned before. So these are the types of commons. I mean, they're not representative and they are you know, fictitious to a large extent, but we thought we'd start off and see how much it would cost potentially, because it would be different for each of these commons to get ready for Elm. Julia, next one, please. Okay, so we've come up with some figures. So in the large common with weak governance, so I'm just going to look at my notes. Um, um, they need some mapping support. They've got some maps, but they need some, uh, mapping support. They, the habitat surveys were out of date and they have to be done again. The legal advice, because they've already got internal agreements in the constitution, these need, um, you know, they need updating and revising, but they probably don't need, you know, thousands of pounds spent on them. Facilitation. Um, there's, there's quite a lot of time on facilitation because we need to work out, or this common needs to work out, what are the, what are the roles of the graziers and the non-graziers and how do you distribute the money? That can take time. Admin, they're, you know, again, they need some support on that. They need their registers updated. So you know, there's a, a significant amount of admin. So we're reckoning it's around 16,000, you know, these are ballpark figures. I mean, we've got 16,000, if you add it up, it's 16,250. We've got the sporting common, which is half the size, but because it's really not doing very much, they're going to need more money spent on maps, more money spent on hab habitat sur sur surveys, more money on legal advice, more money on facilitation, because not only did the graziers don't talk to each other, the two owners have different views on what the common should look like um, and the admin support. So even though it's half the size, it's actually going to cost more to get them in ready for Elm. And then looking at the small common, which is already doing conservation grazing, they don't need a huge, it won't cost them a huge amount, um, legal advice, facilitation and admin. Um, we're talking here about three to four thousand pounds. So what we're trying to say here is that all commons have different circumstances. 
So up to now in countryside stewardship and HLS, there's been a flat payment per hectare, and this may not be the fairest or the best way to pay for the costs. Perhaps it would be a good idea to consider a range of payments which are actually linked to the actual circumstances on the common, or even pay on actual costs incurred up to an agreed limit. Um, you know, this is complex stuff, and the main thing is, all commons are different, it's going to cost more on some commons than others to get into an agreement. Can we have the poll now, please? Is it going to work? Ah, yes. We'll have a little pause, so take a minute to um, answer Viv's poll. <laughs> and, uh, if you want to add anything in the comments about why you've said that, you know, that would be useful. We, we, we won't be able to look at it all tonight, but if you if you want to uh, add a comment of um, why you've said, where, why you've put that answer, we'd love to hear it. Uh, like like we've said, it's just sort of some work we've been doing just to illustrate it, really. It's not um, and based on what we've learned so far, but we're not we're not we're not convinced it's highly accurate, but it's just something to get the discussion going. So. Um, We'd love to know what you think. thinking that might nearly be ever but oh no people are still answering having to think That might nearly be it. We wonder if we'll get to a 140. There. Thanks. Do you want to just uh are you sharing that? Thank you, Julia um, and Susie. Okay, so that, that's Viv on uh some of the work we've been doing through the test and trial around looking at how thing how much things might cost to start getting your common ready for Elm. Can I stop that? There we go. Um, so we'll move on now. If we could go on to the next slide, Julia, and we have got our invited guests, hopefully, in the waiting in the wings to join us. That's great. So um, we thought it'd be interesting rather than uh, just listen to um, Julia and Viv and I all evening, who've been uh, sort of working on the test and trial all the way through. We thought it'd be really good to just um, chat to uh, a couple of people who've been working uh, hard and helping us on one of the commons that um, we worked on in phase one, which was uh, Peter Tavy Common on Dartmoor. Um, can you just go back a bit, Julia? I think I just had a, there was a little Dartmoor. That's the one. So next one, please. That's the one, brilliant, thank you. Um, oh, it keeps wanting to go on. So we, yeah, that's the one we're after. <laughs> uh, so Tracy May uh, worked with us as our local facilitator on Dartmoor and Colin is the chair of the uh, of the common there, Peter Savy Common. So welcome to you two. So basically what we did with them, I'll run through that and then I'm just gonna, we'll have a chat about how you found it. Uh, we did a lot of uh, work on gathering information about public goods and Sandra, the common secretary was fantastic uh, in gathering all that information together. So if you look at that little top uh, right hand picture, um, we did some really sort of, some of the mapping we did in the early bit of the test and trial, we, we got maps printed from Ordnance Survey and then we just got stuck in and scribbled on them and added information to them. So that, and Sandra did a huge amount of work on that, gathering that information, which was great. Uh, so we had to go mapping wise with those hard copy maps. And then Tracy also uh, got stuck in on land app uh, and, uh, and also came along to some training that we did through Ordnance Survey on QGIS which is a really good way of finding out. Um, <laughs> I think I did that training as well. You know, whether, it, whether it's possible for someone who's not a mapping expert to have a go and try and record some of that information. And then we found out, we sort of had to think about what the gaps were in our information. And that's where we got H&H &H to help D 
do um, a habitat, an up-to-date habitat assessment because um, Colin and Tracy and Sandra all thought, you know, some of that information was out, out of date and really wanted to know what the situation was. Uh, and then we had a go at drafting it. Well, you guys had a go at drafting a management plan, didn't you? So um, that's just how it works sort of on, on an individual common. But uh, I'll stop talking now and maybe ask you, Tracy and Colin, how you, how you found it and what you think you learned and what you take away from it, I suppose. Let you go first, Tracy, or no? Oh, okay, I can do, yeah. Um, I mean, for me, one of the things I found was having been involved in the Our Common Cause project, I got a bit of a sort of head start on gathering in from public goods because I'd already been doing that for other commons. Um, so I knew who to ask, but it was, for me, it's the time it takes for other people to be able to get back to you with their information because they're all really busy people. So it's not something you can do really quickly. It takes time. It's not that people aren't willing to help. It's just it takes them time to be able to do, the, do that for you. But everybody was great and sent the information back to me. Um, they got it to me in formats they sent me it on hard copies and uh, shape files that I could load onto land app so I could get it onto the maps quite quickly which was very useful um, I got a bit frustrated with land app because I was struggling with it I actually get on better with QGIS I like it I it suits me but that's not for everybody I'm aware that most people prefer land app seem to um, so yeah, and then drawing up the management plan was lots of people fed into it, lots of different ideas. It just, every everybody worked well. You know, I felt getting it all together. Um, Colin, what do you want to say? Um, well, just a background really for people that don't know, Peter TV is a thousand hectare common, um, about 37 uh, registered rights holders on the common, but only about 18 summer grazers and a few less in the winter. Um, We've been in an environmental scheme for the last 20 years or so. Um, really, we fit scenario number two with, you know, not every commoner gets on with each other. But we had some hard times at the beginning to sign in. Um, and th this process is kind of, you know, we've had natural England on our case to reduce our sheep numbers in the last four or five years because the common is well used. Um, access is quite easy for most, most commoners. Um, so we just wanted to see, see an alternative. And this process has given us the opportunity to, for an independent ecologist to assess our common, you know, some of the findings that he has come up with and some of the plants that you know, are, are there, may, they may be short, but they, they, they wouldn't be there otherwise. Um, so I find that process, you know, it, there's lots of information out there, but it's trying to get it all together. And, um, you know, Tracy and, and the help of Sandra, our secretary, has put all the information together. So it's just collating all the information and trying to put it into one document and is then, then accessible for all. But, you know, I think it's been a, a process that, you know, that everybody's who's contributed has, has gained information from it, you know, especially the bird surveys and the depth of peat and all that, you know, it's all, all been collated together now, um, but it, you know, it does take time. I suppose that's, that's one, one good point. I think somebody, I think I saw something in the, in the chat about that, you know, and we said this right back at the start, I think we found that there's a lot of information on a lot of commons, but it's really quite dispersed. So Tracy, like you were saying, you, that was one of the big things for you at the start was to gather that, um from different organizations and different sort of users and interest groups wasn't it and get it all together and i suppose the good thing was that you already knew, you know and i think this is important that you know who to go to when you've got some yeah. good sort of contacts and relationships with people so that made quite a difference didn't it i think being able to get hold of, of stuff and know who to yeah. go to for it and oh, find it all yeah yeah def definitely it's it is knowing where you can act you can actually find the information um, because a lot of it is out there, but you just don't know how to get hold of it. Um, that was one of the things with doing the um, QGIS training was actually finding out how much of that in, this information is in the public domain and you can just find it online and download it. You know, this was for mapping, but it is a lot of it is available, but it's knowing where to look. Yeah. Is, is anything like, else either you want to say if, and then we'll move well, on. Well, yeah, I'd just like to say that, you know, the management plan, you've drawn up with a, you know, a 10 year plan, you know, what the common should look like in maybe 10 years time. You know, my vision is, is, is that, you know, I'd like to see commoners still being active on the common. 
you know, you know, my biggest worry is that they will start to fall by the wayside if they're not supported well enough. Um, and then, you know, and then, then the common is being unused. And so it, it's, you know, it's just trying to get that vision of everybody sat around the table with, you know, looking in the same direction rather than just being dictated to by one or two individuals, you know, around the, the environmentalist type of thing. Thank you. Colin yeah and I think that's probably where we've said you know it was really good to have a facilitator he was a bit you know he's independent from the common and can get everybody together and, and he's good at getting everybody talking and uh, trying exactly. to come up with some consensus yeah yeah is that all right Tracy yeah that's brilliant thanks so much for uh, joining us and just giving us a little insight into how it went on Peter Turvey that's great thank you okay, okay. There I am, I'm muting myself. Um, so just quickly then, uh, and then we'll pause for some questions in a minute. Um, we've, we've, we've bombarded you with quite a lot of information, but I think there's probably sort of four big points that we're feeding back to DEFRA. You know, we've just submitted a report and we've got one more report um, to, to wrap everything up uh, next month. Um, so a few things that we've, we've sort of really uh, highlighted. One is there's definitely some upfront investment that Commons are gonna need uh, to get themselves ready for Elm. And as Viv has kind of highlighted, you know, that, that's going to vary widely between commons, but to get yourself ready, you know, it's going it's to cost something, uh, depending on, on the characteristics of your common. We think it's really important that there's somebody um, who can facilitate the sort of process of helping you to get ready. Um, and ideally, you know, somebody who's a bit independent, but, you know, Tracy, Obviously, Tracy can't do the whole of England <laughs> and she's local to Dartmoor. But really, it was really helpful that Tracy, you know, knew where to start and, and had got good relationships with people, but isn't a grazier or, you know, an, an active common or anything like that on Peter Tavy, but, but she knows it well. And then we've sort of highlighted that we think there's probably, people are probably going to need some kind of maybe advice that they might need to commission. So if their habitat service are, are out of date, for example, or they want to know more about the peat uh, and that information is not up to date, or they're interested to learn more about the historic environment, for example, or, or, or special features, they might need to commission some advice. But hopefully by using things like the toolkit uh, and other bits uh, that are around and, and just you know, using your own common sense and now uh, you'll be able to do some of it yourself and have a go at some of it yourself. Um, so that sort of leads on to the final one, I think which is there's lots of sort of ways that we can probably share information with each other, whether it's through a federation of commoners or commoners councils uh, that work well, whether it's through, um, we thought we might put sort of an information bit of a hub on, on the toolkit where people who are working really hard as common secretaries and administrators and who are really skilled can you know maybe share some of their skills too. Uh, so we think that's a really sort of important way of people uh, supporting each other and learning uh, as they go along. So there were some of the things we sort of highlighted uh, in the test and trial report. I think we'll just go on to the next one, Julia, and then we'll have a pause. OK, so in terms of what next on the test and trial, as I said, we're getting towards the end. We're on the final furlong, really. We've got a couple of events um, coming up, one on the 10th of February in Helmsley and one uh, in Sedber, where we're just going to give people a chance to um, have a go with some of these tools and guidance that we've been developed and get a bit more feedback from them and also sort of, you know, share some of our findings. Uh, so that'll be a real kind of practical event. And then we've got, as I said, our final report to DEFRA uh, is due end of February, beginning of March, and then we'll present our findings to them. Uh, we've also, the Foundation for Common Land has also been successful in securing a contract for another test and trial focusing on lowlands. So that's going to be very uh, much based on the New Forest and the Malvern Hills. Uh, and then the other thing that's going on where, um, you know, you might hear about more bits of advice or things you might want to be interested in or uh, get a bit more information on relates to the Our Upland Commons project, which is a heritage fund funded big project that's working across a number of commons in England uh, and the Foundation for Common Land is a national trust are uh, running that. I forgot that right, Julia, on the Upland Commons project. <laughs> yes, it's 24 part, 25 partners um, and you know, all farming organisations, nature conservation organisations, um, lots of commoners 
uh, the, we convene the partnership of 25 and the, the National Trust to kindly the accountable body. So yes, that's running for three and a half years. So we'll be able to keep going with this work, although this test and trial is over. Yeah, we'll keep, keep moving on. Thanks for that. OK, so we're not doing too badly. I've just looked at my running order and at 8.15, we're meant to pause and have questions so far. So we've made it, we're just three minutes <laughs> behind. So thanks for your patience sir, as we've rattled through all of those um, slides and bits of information. Hopefully it's uh, raised some questions. So we'll have a look now at the questions and uh, feel free to do your upvoting or um, asking any questions in there. Uh, shall I go to the, um, oh, your, are you typing an answer to Tim, Viv? Uh, then I've got one from Bridget, which um, I'll, I'll pass to you if that's okay, Julia. Is there any work to put together a draft legal agreement or internal deed that would cover all commons? Thanks very much, Joe, and thanks, Bridget. Um, good to see you on the, or not see you, but to have your question on the, uh, on the call. Um, yeah, it's really complicated in terms of internal agreements. Um, what's the best way to do this? Because I know people. Um, are nervous and, and understandably why they're spending a lot of money on commons and why does every common have to do this? It's it, the, the key is that there's a lot of money involved. A lot of these commons are having, you know, certainly tens and in some cases hundreds of thousands of pounds and sometimes over a million pounds per common being spent. And it's really critical that you have that, um, you, your, your internal agreement is professionally put together and we recommend that in order of that to be robust and to be able to be enforced in court it needs to be a deed and deeds can only be drafted by lawyers so any document really for more than three years needs to be um, put together as as a deed and that involves a lawyer what we're we've put in our toolkit is we put together heads some ideas for heads of terms so how to instruct a lawyer and um, effectively and in many cases the land agent works um, very closely with the lawyer in terms of uh, doing those instructions, or it may be the facilitator or whoever else is involved. Um, when it comes to SFI, we are though looking at whether we can potentially put together a, a sort of template contract because SFI Moreland agreements are only expected to last for three years. And we, um, in many cases, none of the money will be given out. And certainly the suggestion and recommendation of the Foundation for Common Land is there's not enough money on the SFI Moreland to actually give any, any of it out. Um, it may be different if you've only got one or two commoners and a very large common, but in most cases it's going to be need to prepare. It's a preparative scheme and therefore we think we, we are um, going to be looking at preparing a, a sort of draft contract. Ideally, DEFRA would prepare this contract and that it would there be one that would, a bit like if you're setting up a company or you're setting up a charity, there are draft constitutions provided by the government and you, you change a few things, but you actually keep most of the text the same and you can be assured it's been put together well by law. But at the moment, DEFRA have declined the opportunity to put together that draft contract. But we do have some budget where we will be working with a lawyer very experienced in internal agreements to look at whether we can put together a draft contract. There. But I would say with regard to local nature recovery and landscape recovery, you should seek professional advice and have the document drafted as a deed. And any land agents on the call, please note you are not allowed to draft internal agreements as a deed. That is illegal. So um, it's really important that you, that you protect yourselves and ensure that your clients get the right advice. Um, and that means from a qualified lawyer. You're, you're mute, Joe. Sorry about that. It was a bit stuck. Um, we've got, thanks for that, uh, Julia. So then we've got another question from Richard around, um, about, around habitat surveys, pointing out that, you know, a lot of the data might already exist um, if the land is triple SI. Um, so maybe you could just be copying and pasting that. And I suppose, um, well, I can give you a bit of feedback in terms of what we found on the test and trial. Um, so obviously, if the triple SI data is there and it's up to date and everybody's confident with it and happy with it, that's fine. Um, 
on some of the commons, obviously there's not, it's not all just triple SI. There could be a lot of other habitat as well, which is not triple SI. So that's uh, on the commons that we've worked with. That's where people have said, you know, I would like to sort of identify gaps in the information said we maybe need a bit more of that. And then the other thing obviously is not just all about habitats. So, uh, and um, plants and biodiversity and all the rest of it, you know, it could be around, for example, visitor access or carbon or carbon sequestration uh, or soils you know so there's a lot there's lots of other information that people have said they'd be interested in finding out more about and as, as we get to know more about the schemes um that will you know and what, and what payments might be for then obviously that will help people to decide uh what information they might need but yeah good point on the triple si if the information's up to date and everybody's confident with it then you'll be able to use that does anybody want to add, add anything to that I'm taking that as a no. We'll move on. We've got another question from Harriet, uh, which was to you, Viv. So I'll, I'll pass it to you. Um, was the cost of time for commoners and owners to participate excluded from consideration on the assumption their time will be remunerated through their participation? Um, I think we did a bit of a fudge here, let's say, because um, as, as, as I was trying to mention before, I mean, all commons different, um, commoners are different, skills levels are different. Um, and so what we were trying to do is ballpark figures. Now, whether the commoners get paid for doing surveys and assessments, you know, that could go into the figure that we've given or not. So I, and also it very much depends on how the common works. So there is, um, there is an assumption, I, would, I certainly would like to make the assumption that commoners do get paid for their time, but also they will get remunerated through their participation for the ELM. So, you know, this is a complex, I mean, there are no, we don't have any, standard ways of doing this yet and very much depends on how the common itself works so I'm sorry that's an you know there's a bit of a vague answer but I mean I think you know what I'm trying to the point I'm really trying to get across here is that actually all commons are different and it goes back to um, I think it's Anne Wilcox's question is about you know our prices might seem low compared to Dartmoor or whatever but it so much depends on the circumstances and often the cost can really really rise if people cannot get one with each other um, and they have to spend a lot of time negotiating. Right, so that sort of touches on your point, Anne, um, compared with um, thinking about collating data from, from commons that entered HLS a long time ago, or you know, 10 years ago, um, and compare that with uh, proposals for, for current schemes. Um, if we had time, we, we, we could have a go at that. We, we'll, we'll want to do a bit more on this cost thing. So, um, you know, if anybody's got anything they think's interesting and they want to share it, feel free to send it to us. You know, we'd love to see it because it, obviously, as I said, we're not far from wrapping up our test and trial. So um, we're a bit limited in how much more data we can gather. But if, think, if people have got things they're interested in, you know, I'd like to share, you know, we'd love to hear from you. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, mean, so I, could that is... Joe. I could chip in a bit if you'd like. Um, yeah, go for it, yeah. I mean, you know, Anne's referring to HLS from over 10 years ago, and, and when it, HLS was going through, I think I put in 48 different commons into um, HLS 65,000 hectares. And yeah, then at that point, you've got what was called HR8 and then U, UX1, and it's a total of £10 a hectare. And you, given commons are generally are VAT registered, that there was no change from that. So it cost overall, including the negotiation, the lawyers' fees, it cost £10 a hectare. So you've got the surveys and the lawyers' fees, and that was with the FEP grant as well. So it is substantial. Um, more recently with countryside stewardship, when you've already perhaps got data and you, you're moving on from a, if you have a well-established agreement, sometimes doing it again if there haven't been too many changes. But certainly we're um, looking at at least um, six pounds a hectare, but also what the big difference now is that a lot of capital works are required and it's very complicated putting together a capital works plan, particularly if you're doing fencing, if you're doing peatland restoration, you're having to get quotes and costs for that. So su suddenly you could find it's over 12 pounds a hectare, roughly. It's not always linked to the hectare, just as we've quite rightly said, but it's often linked to the number of individuals involved and their relationships. Um, and, and as Viv said, those costs can escalate extremely quickly. I mean, go from 10,000 to 20,000 within a month, um, you know, if people fall out. And some, well, sometimes the best way to get people to stop falling out with each other is to tell them how much it's costing per hour for them to be annoyed with each other. 
and then that sometimes brings people to their senses. There's a, another question here from Keith. Thanks for yours, Keith. Um, just thinking about uh, whether we'll make any sort of comments around costs over the 10 years, so around monitoring and managing the agreement. And we've start, we did it, we've started to do a little bit of that. Um, we, we, but I wouldn't say we've, we've completely cracked it. Um, so I know Viv, you've done a bit of work on sort of, you know, the ongoing costs of administering. We've done a bit of work around, uh, and we've also highlighted the importance of good monitoring. So one of the things that we suggested uh, if we're going to have a management plan uh, and, and get into a scheme is that once a year and probably at the AGM you know there should be a, a focus on monitoring and thinking about how things are progressing rather than kind of just leaving that till the end of the agreement so that that would be a good point Keith that you'd want to build in some time and the cost of doing that well to make to make sure that you're sort of keeping that up to date and build some like monitoring. Add, sorry interrupting. No, no, it's fine. Um, I'd also like, uh, like to add, because I mean, what we're seeing in countryside stewardship is often that natural England is prepared to pay for a, a, the first few years in agreement, but actually these costs continue throughout the agreement and it needs to be a payment rate for every year. For, you know, if you want a scheme managed well, you're going to have to pay for it and it doesn't, management doesn't stop after year one or two. Thanks, Viv. Um, we'll keep, those questions are still there and we've got a bit more time for, to answer some more of them a bit later on. So we'll stick to my uh, schedule of timing. Uh, we'll have a little pause for another poll, if that's okay, Susie, if you could put that up. And then I'm gonna to pass to you, Julia. It's just to find out who everybody is actually, or, or roughly how you would identify yourself, uh, which is quite interesting for us to see what um, who's on the call. Looks like most of the people who are going to um, fill that in have filled it in, doesn't it? Thanks. So there's just a little overview of, of who we've got. Thank you. And that's really useful for us just to, when we put out, you know, give our feedback and get an overview of, um, I should say that we think um, in the report that I was writing recently, these webinars that we've held throughout the test and trial, I can't remember how many we've done actually, but um, three or four, and we've reached over 850 people plus who's on the call tonight and who watches this one so that has been a, a really you know we've been absolutely delighted that so many people have joined us and uh, given us good feedback as well and, and asked questions and comments so we really appreciate that thank you that's just useful for us to feedback um okay so we'll move on now then so what, what we wanted to do in the in the next sort of bit of the webinar and then we've got some more time for um We've got some more time for more questions towards the end, but we sort of wanted to have a think about uh, this is all, I, I don't want you to go away thinking, oh, this is all very interesting, but it's a test and trial. What does it really mean for me in practice? Does it mean anything? Is any of this going to be relevant in the future? Um, so we thought it was probably worth having a chat about the latest sort of updates that, that we've got, that we've all been getting on how policy is developing and then have a little think about, well, knowing what we know, uh, are there things that we've learned from the test and trial that can can help us to prepare uh, for new schemes? So I'm going to pass to Julia now to just run through a few slides on policy developments. Thanks, Julia. Well, thank you very much, Joe. And um, it's been really great to have so much engagement today. And and this is for real. You know, Zephra are designing the policy um, as you know, in a sense, as we speak, and we're having almost daily conversations with the, the policymakers. We're delighted that Janet Hughes is on the webinar listening in today, and also um, one of the colleagues in the SFI development team 
uh, Ian Condliffe. So we're really pleased to have DEFRA listening in, and I hope taking notes as well. I, but it, so we've been running our test and trial in a in an iterative way, where alongside working very um, intensively with commons on the ground, we've been having regular conversations. And the Foundation for Common Land, separate from the test and trial, has very active engagement um, with what's called the Elms Engagement Group. Um, so I just wanted to sort of make this a, a, a real, and some of you will be aware that there have been some announcements uh, this week, not just that George Eustace has new glasses, um, which um, I hadn't seen before, but um, there have been um, quite a lot going on in the last few weeks, both before Christmas with the SFI announcement, and then um, when the Secretary of State gave his um, speech at uh, the Oxford Farming Conference and uh, just after his speech, documents were put online. Um, I should add that you know, ELM and SFI are still very much in development and subject to change. So please don't um, design uh, the future of your farm or common solely on what I'm saying today, or you know, you, it's important to keep up to date with things and we will be updating as we go along. That's particularly if you're listening to this as a recording um, some months um, in the future. So George Eustace gave his speech, and I'm not going to go through the whole speech, but um, these are some quotes um, that I extracted. So he said that their aim of um, the government is to restore 300,000 hectares of wild hab wildlife habitat by 2042. That's through both um, the local nature recovery and the landscape recovery scheme. 300,000 hectares is about 2.4% of England. So um, if you're a nature conservationist, you might say that was not very ambitious. Um, there's 370,000, well, about 400,000 hectares of common land, including the new forest, and 52% uh, of that is designated um, for nature, is for nature through being a triple SI. Um, also, the government have also sought to have a um, the sign up to 30 by 30, which is an international commitment to restore 30% of, of one's nation's, um, you know, manage 30% of your nation's land for, for wildlife. So, you know, lots going on there, but, you know, we're very, they're very much on the journey to put nature recovery at the heart of the ELM scheme. Um, we would say as the Foundation for Common Land, we feel that cultural her heritage and public access should have equal weight in these baskets of public goods. Uh, but at the moment, the focus is very much on nature recovery and climate and water. So another quote, on average, we are going to increase rates in countryside stewardship by around 30%. And I'm going to come back to this because this is quite key in terms of the here and now, because when the future is a bit misty, we can focus on the here and now. So we'll delve into that a little bit more. In terms of the rates, um, looking forward, uh, George Eustace has very much said that we are going to be um, moving away from a, a strict income foregone measure and said that rates will be set at the level needed to incentivize uptake required on the scale we need to deliver our environmental objectives. Um, so that will be something to hold um, the Secretary of State too, because um, when we look at the rates going forward, I imagine there'll be a range of views as to whether that meets the, both the full cost recovery and also provides what I'd say at least the living wage foundation wage. You're providing a public service. They are public goods. People who are working in uh, schools or hospitals or libraries are paid properly for their work. And we think that um, the labor um, for delivering public and environmental goods should also be compensated appropriately. And then finally, um, George Eustace's quote, um, uh, and never short on ambition, he says, I hope today I have been able to articulate a clear path that we have towards our final destination. And I will leave that hanging. So in terms of um, where we, uh, what's been happening, so we've had uh, on the 6th, um, maybe it was the 7th of January, the countryside stewardship rates increased. These have been published. This is quite significant and we'll come back to this. Um, so those are for current countryside stewardship schemes and for those that will be entered into from this January and from 2023 at the beginning of 24. So those are um, stewardship schemes. Um, it does not apply to higher level stewardship schemes. So if you're currently under a rollover, you will be receiving no change in your payment rate. Um, there, um, 
and it, I don't want to second guess DEFRA's logic, but one of the reasons they have given is that generally high level stewardship um, rates, particularly in the uplands where they're underpinned by UELS, are higher than countryside stewardship rates anyway, um, even though the schemes started a long time previously in 2005. Then um, the, the other big announcement is for particularly with relevance to Upland Commons is Sustainable Farming Incentive and the SFI um, 22. So this is the Moreland introductory standards. You may be aware with some SFI standards, there are three levels of ambition, introductory, intermediate and advanced. At the moment, we only have the introductory standard for Moreland. And if you want more details on this, we do have some uh, videos from other talk, another talk we did in December about this. That's on our YouTube channel. And I'll just very briefly say a little bit about that. But it is the big thing for 2022. This is going to occupy a lot of many of our time on, on how we make this work in practice. Then the um, other two um, key announcements from Oxford were around local nature recovery and landscape recovery. And I'll say a little bit more about those in a moment. So looking at the increase in countryside stewardship rates, there are about, I, I think it's 132 countryside stewardship options. So these are things that, you know, you can see that they've all got little codes and lots of you will be familiar with these. Uh, you may know the HLS codes rather than the um, countryside stewardship, but we have things like UP4, SP1, LH1. So they're all different, different codes. And what's interesting is that, um, as George used this completely accurately said, the mean increase, so he calls it the average, but it is the mean, um, it, the increase is, is 30%. Um, but what we find is that six of these options have increased by greater than 100%, and 53% of the options have increased by less than 15%. Um, so the mean increase is 30%, but the median increase is 14% and the mode increase is zero. So these are all the ones at this end here. Um, so uh, you've, um, so yeah, that's um, all these ones at this end here. So none of those have gone up. Um, we have quite a lot here that fall into, they've got um, percentage. And then we have um, some mammoth increase. This one here is of particular interest to upward farms, this penultimate one, which is, um, for upland um, uh, low input grasslands. And I'll just show you a few because it's a bit hard to really read that graph, but it just gives you a feeling for um, how uh, there are um, certain winners in this game. So this is a graph, in, I'm not, I, some of you may be on quite small screens, it may be quite hard to read, but I've been through and picked out some of the particular, the upland options under countryside stewardship. We have UP3, which is the main payment rate. That's gone up from £43 to £51, a 19% increase. That's the Moreland management payment. UP6, the off-wintering supplement, has gone up just a small amount um, from £16 per hectare to £18, a 30% increase. The commons management supplement, and this is, you know, when Viv was talking about the costs of um, putting together an agreement, this hasn't gone up at all. Um, the cattle grazing supplement, bizarrely, has gone down, um, which seems to me odd given the costs of managing cattle, I don't believe, have gone down. I mean, the price of beef may have gone up, but cattle grazing, when you're doing it extensively on a common, is a pretty cost of, costly enterprise to undertake. This does not apply if you're currently in a countryside stewardship scheme. You will receive the amount you have on your current contract, which is £45 a hectare. So what's happening is if, if the payment's going up, then you get the increased payment. If the payment's going down, you stick with your current agreement, your current payment. Before entering into a new scheme, then you will get these new payments. Scrub payment. So this is for creation of scrub. This has gone up 12%. Livestock exclusion from scrub woodland. This is when keeping your sheep and cattle out of newly planted scrub woodland has gone down by 39%. I don't know why that is the case. Um, these I've just looked at, done the analysis of today, the, the detailed analysis, so um, we need to look into these a bit more. Creation of upland wood pasture. This it hasn't changed, but it did go up substantially last year, so that remains an attractive option. And then the big winner is um, 
uh, upland low input grassland, which has gone up by 344% to £71 a hectare, up from £16 a hectare. So nothing to do with commons, but if your, your farm is not currently in a scheme, um, I highly recommend if you're you know, having up you know, in the uplands and have low input grassland that you look at GS5, re-look at stewardship scheme, and you can get that through mid-tier as well. So looking at SFI 22, this is the moorland and rough grazing um, standard. The indicative payments are that, um, and they are being reviewed, so it may change. Um, I would hope they're being reviewed upwards. Um, is six pounds forty-five per hectare per year for a three-year agreement, plus every agreement will get an extra one hundred and forty-eight pounds per agreement. So if you're on a thousand hectare common, you would your payment would be six thousand five hundred ninety-eight pounds per year. In addition, there may be a common supplement. We're not sure how much that will be, and they're therefore working on that at the moment. You will have three um, elements to um, th this, is, and it's very much a preparative scheme. So you're not doing actual land management. You're preparing for entering into either SFI, intermediate or advanced, or into local nature recovery. So the first element is verifying and recording your soil and vegetation types. The second is evaluating the public goods potential of your soil and vegetation and other public goods. And thirdly is identifying opportunities for enhancing these. So that might be in terms of peat restoration will be an example, or can you do some um, managing scrub or you know, maybe you've got um, opportunities for managing bracken. Um, so th those would be the sort of things we're looking at. As I say, if you want more information on that, please do watch our um, video from um, December. So um, Tracy's mentioned QGIS. Um, I have to say, not being as technical as QGIS, I very much are a land app person um, because I like my life to be really simple. Um, and I, we've uh, been working quite closely with the land app um, as well as with Ordnance Survey. And um, anybody who's used the land app will know that they will see there's a button and it says import from rural payments agency. If you're on your own farm, you can click this button, type in your SBI and all the data is downloaded. Currently, that doesn't work with commons, but we have been trialing to make this work. I've got another meeting, we meet, we meet with RPA monthly and they've done some trials for us. And they did this, which was on the forest of Dartmoor. And not only can we were able to use the SBI to import the land parcels, but we were, were able to upload photos. So these are um, some uh, Dartmoor um, commoners and the, the Dutch sort of um, land agent and uh, Natural England director. And you can see the little camera there. So you can put information there. I mean, probably you'd have a picture of some um, it, it, vegetation. I just found a photo I had hanging around. It was geotagged. Very smartly. Very smartly yeah. dressed on Dartmoor. <laughs> well, well Leyland, uh, Leyland is, yeah, he's got his tire out, out for the day. It was a day we'd all been with Prince, the Prince of Wales earlier that okay. day. That's why we were all dressed so smartly. Well, that was the regular, the regular um, clothes that you wear on Dartmoor. Yeah. You ne never go and check your sheet without a tie on, you know, posh dad south, you know. Um, so, yeah, uh, so that's, um, uh, so it's really, really important that you can geotag your photos. If you use a normal phone, then as long as you have the, geo the, the sort of in location on, your photo will be geo, what's called geotagged. And then when you literally drag your photo onto the map, it will upload it and put a little camera where that photo was taken. And this is going to be really helpful for looking at where different vegetation is, where you take readings of peat depths. It's it's incredibly simple. I did all this on a train journey down to Dartmoor, um, and and also reports can be produced. As Tracy says, there's a lot of information out there. Um, so moving on to local nature recovery, and these are just some key highlights. I'm not covering everything that was in the announcement last week. It is available on gov.uk. So um, it is an evolution of countryside stewardship, local nature recovery. It's for, for, for farms and, um, and also commons to apply and to be delivering local nature recovery with target looking um, both on individual farms and also collaboration. There'll be a pilot running in 2023 and five, they're looking, um, DEFRA looking for 500 agreements to be, um, to be entered into at that stage. We don't know yet whether Commons will be asked to apply as well. It may be an opportunity there. Um, 
uh, but it probably could be quite a short scheme and it may be worth waiting till it's rolled out in full, which is going to happen in late 2024. And late 2024, from then onwards, we are not expecting any more HLS um, rollovers. So commons need to really think about being prepared. This is a, in, you know, in a couple of years time that if you're in an HLS rollover, you need to be looking at entering into a local linked recovery. So this is why we recommend you going into SFI more than to get that money. However, um, smaller quantum is to prepare yourselves for the next step. Uh, DEFRA are expecting um, to have a land management plan, but they're looking at various options and there isn't a formal commitment for that, but it is expected. And the Commons Management Plan, the, the work we, we've been doing through this test and trial is feeding into that. The, um, uh, the Secretary of State has promised more flexibility to be able to add in both land if you're you know, if things change during the agreement and to add different options as well, because currently you're stuck with, with whatever you've got. And um, you will be able to stack SFI and LNR as long as there's no double funding, or you're not being paid for the same thing twice through the two schemes. And we have been promised a simple digital service for SFI and LNR and a smooth transition between your current agreement and the um, new agreement. So that's very good news. Moving on to landscape recovery, and this is a quote from the document, the landscape recovery scheme will support more radical changes to land use change and habitat restoration, such as establishing new nature reserves, restoring floodplains or creating woodlands and wetlands. This was DEFRA on the 6th of January 2022. And so they're looking at and they're looking at piloting this in 2022 for 15 agreements um, I, and Commons are eligible to enter into this. And as uh, Joe has said, the Foundation for Common Land is running a trial looking at landscape recovery in the Mulfans and in the New Forest. And we're going to be advertising for, for a member of staff to work in each of those um, from next week. We'll, we'll be advertising next week. If you're interested in a three day a week job, please do get in touch with us. Um, so it's Looking at landscape recovery, it, they're particularly um, focusing on uh, rivers and catchments um, to begin with, and with nature recovery. Um, it's going to and, and restoring habitats. Um, but commons have um, they're really important in in terms of water management. They're really important in terms of nature, and we very much want to be looking at creating uh, wooden. So there are a lot of commons which are doing large amounts of um, scrub creation at the moment. I can think of. What in, Com in Cumbria, where you know there's a lot of wood pasture being created, so we do feel it's not going to be for everyone at all. But please don't rule out landscape recovery. And there have been quite a lot of shorthands used, re the alternative names for landscape recovery. And I'm as guilty as as others of using those. But we must be careful not to pigeonhole landscape recovery just as one particular type of managing land. There will, and that's where we very much want to look at opportunities for commons there. And DEFRA wants that as well. Otherwise, um, they wouldn't have given us the, um, the test and trial to look at how we can make it work on commons. So we've been linking you know, the test and trial and the work we've done. We're really hoping through the test and trial, we're not just writing a report to DEFRA. It's not an MSC thesis that just sits in the shelf in DEFRA or sits in someone's hard drive it's going to or in the cloud we're looking at how we can link our test and trial with current policy and future management so what are our sort of three top tips in terms of moving forward start preparing now so you can make informed choices and in order to start preparing now you do collect data do use the opportunity um the sfi um moreland uh, will um give that that scheme will give you because knowledge is power and with that becomes opportunities. It might be that you went into ELM, it might be that you look at um, other ways of uh, levering uh, financial opportunities out of um, that biodiversity um, credits, their uh, carbon credits, there are lots of different ways. I know it's a bit of a, as a, Lord Benyon mentioned, a, a snake oil salesman in terms of these private providers at the moment, and but it's very much the way things are going. Um, and so, as I say, leave the maximum outcomes from SFI 22. If you are a lowland common, if you are not moorland, either if you're SDA or you're lowland, then I'm afraid SFI 22 is not currently available. We think this is a 
significant gap in what DEFRA is offering, and we hope it will be remedied before long. So we've um, we've spent uh, the last 18 months and really so ably led by Joe in terms of lots of local facilitators, lots of commoners involved, and all of this sort of community that, as Joe said, we created. And we have learned an awful lot during that time, and we're really appreciative of the opportunity that DEFRA have given us to do this work, and both the Federation of Cumbria Commoners working with the Foundation for Common Land, as well as lots of other commons associations around the country. But I just wanted to um, make sure that the, you, you just, these are the sort of the four key things that we hope that DEFRA will take into account. The upfront investment is needed. We will not get good schemes. Someone asked a question like, all this money is just going to professionals. It's a very small amount of money compared to the amount of public money that will be spent. And what's important is that public money is spent well, and that means you need to know what you're spending it on and what are the outcomes you're going to get and how you're going to get there. Good independent facilitation is absolutely critical, and the Foundation for Common Land has put a paper to, uh, and it's publicly available on our website with the Tenant Farmers Association, of it's really important because uh, that we have this independent facilitation, independent financial management. This is public money, and most commoners will be beneficiaries, and it's really important that people don't get into positions where they're conflicted in terms of dishing money out to themselves. In terms of advice and guidance, we think there are opportunities for both people collecting um, data and uh, information themselves, but also in some cases we'll need to com commission advice and guidance. And in terms of we're really keen to make sure we can use existing networks and build new networks to share knowledge and good practice. Um, so it's a really scary next few years. It's quite exciting, but it is quite unnerving as we move forward um, in this level of uncertainty and um, iterative scheme development is fine for people who are on monthly salaries. I would say it's quite scary for those who are looking to, to run businesses where, where often ELM schemes um, and you know, currently it's stewardship schemes are at the heart of, of their business. So we do hope that this works where um, uh, sometimes I'm hot, cup half full, sometimes I'm cup quarter full, but we're trying to keep optimistic and continue to be that bridge between yourselves who are actually delivering and doing the work on the ground and working with DEFRA. Thanks, Julia. Thanks for that update. And hopefully uh, people have, got, have found uh, plenty to take away from that. Um, we're nearly at nine o'clock and really keen that we finish on time. So. I'm just going to, we've got two sort of questions that have come to the top with the, with the upvoting. So we've got a quick crack at those, I think, and then, and then we'll wrap everything up uh, and say goodnight. So the first, the top one, thank you to Paul for posing that. And quite a few people are interested in this. How to make individual commoners accountable in internal agreements without penalising all the commoners who've met their obligations, which I think we've talked a bit about before. Um, but if Viv or Julie want to answer that in 30 seconds or a minute well, <laughs> I'll have a shot at it. I mean, this um, is why you need a good internal agreement and this is why I was talking about rules and, and pen, you know, penalties it's and dispute resolution. It is absolutely critical that this is the whole point we don't want a tragedy of a commons we want a commons to run effectively and that means that this is why you invest in a good lawyer you get make sure that they know about commons and you have uh, you have your local facilitator, whether they're an you know whatever sort of advisor that they they are, that they work together, and you come up with a scheme where you can enforce against the minority. The other thing is, if people know there is something happening that isn't right, they must share that information, and they must have a trusted person they can go to because it's very very hard to um, you know to effectively feel you're shopping your neighbour. And that's one of the huge challenges of delivering on commons. So mechanisms whereby people see that there is a safe space for them to have these conversations and that situations can be remedied before there are significant penalties is critical. I was just thinking, Viv, you did a really good uh, slot on this in our last webinar at the end of September, didn't you? So if um, Paul, you were keen or anybody wanted to go back and have a look at that YouTube um video of that session there were a lot of good practical tips and advice on there that you went through Viv weren't there you're mute Viv 
very always happens i would totally agree with julia i mean one thing i want to say is i mean about rules is to i've seen agreements that have too many rules in them it's about actually boiling it down to what are the really important rules that you've got to stick to and that people understand um so yeah don't have too many rules but make sure that they're important ones thanks Viv. just one more then from martin and then we'll wrap up so thanks for your question martin which is around, uh, I, can, I don't know if you can see that, Julia and Viv, the owners of the commons who sometimes are reluctant to sign the internal agreement and they're concerned about the ownership of carbon. I know that's come up in some conversations, hasn't it? And therefore further reluctance possibly to sign up and whether we've got any views on that. Do you want to uh, have a quick stab at that either of you? <laughs> Just a quick... Well, we, we <laughs> have a great question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, it's so case specific. You could have individual owners who are absolutely collaborative and working really closely and are supportive of the commoners. You can have individual commoners who are really obstructive and prevent schemes go ahead. And you can have individual owners who are using the, the scheme to lever other things from the commoners who may, some of them may be their tenants. It's a very, very complex balance of power between people. And I think the key is saying, and, we, and we, I remember when I was down in Dartmoor, we were discussing this, is that an owner um, on a common cannot be delivering the sequestration. When you're going carbon credits, it's not about what's there, it's about the flux, it's about capturing more carbon, because what people are paying for is for you to sequester more and store more. That is so linked to how the common is managed by the commoners, that this isn't something that anyone can go solo with. It's really important that working together, it's that cooperation, not conflict, that it's really hard because people think this is mine and that's someone else, you know, they, they've got their bit, I've got my bit. But on a common, although there are these bundles of different property interests, delivering public benefits and public goods and private goods really works so much better through collaboration. And that's where the facilitation is critical. Mm -hmm. OK, so it's nine o'clock now. Just to um, wrap up then, we've really galloped through a lot of information tonight uh, and shared that with you. You know, do feel free. We'll, when we get the recording uploaded, we'll send that round. So if you want to look at anything again, uh, do. All the stuff that you've written in the chat and the questions is really useful to us. So even if we've not got to your question, we know, we know what you're interested in and what's still bugging you. So that's really helpful for us from a test and trial point of view. Thank you. I want to say thank you to Tracy and Colin for quite last minute uh, <laughs> agreeing to join us tonight and just giving us that little insight um, on how things worked on Dartmoor. We really appreciate that and, uh, and your enthusiasm. I think I maybe only asked you yesterday. So that's great. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I think we've got one last poll to finish on. So obviously thanks to Viv and Julia as well and to you all for joining us. We'll put that poll up uh, and if you want to just answer it uh, before you go, that'd be great and look out for information um, about these two events we've got in Helmsley and Sedba. Uh, if you're local to that, you might be interested in coming along to those, uh, but there'll be information going out about those shortly. Um, so again, thanks so much for joining us. Hope you found it useful um, and feel free to head off and enjoy the rest of your evening. If you wouldn't mind filling in that poll, that'd be quite interesting. So thanks very much everybody uh, and take care and uh, look out for further updates. Thanks to Susie. If anyone's got any queries, if they um, you know, want to email, um, Susie is the, is the sort of control room behind the Foundation for Common Land. Um, so where um, you can contact her via our website or susie at foundationforcommonland.org.uk or use our website to get in touch.